Number five, Al Warden. American test pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut Alfred Merrill Warden was the module pilot for the Apollo 15 lunar mission in 1971. One of the 24 people who have flown to the moon. Woohoo! He's got a couple of firsts though. He orbited it 74 times in the command module. He was the first to drive a moon car. After Apollo 15 reached lunar orbit and his crewmates departed and Warden spent three days alone in his module. That's terrifying. Traveling the furthest out from any other human. After he returned, the crew and him became involved in a NASA controversy, however. Not over leaked alien info, but over postage stamps they had taken to the moon. Yeah, big uh, no-no, apparently. They were reprimanded by NASA and did not fly in space again. Warden remained at NASA until 1975, then entered a private sector. And then it gets weird. On a British television morning show, Al Warden started talking about some interesting stuff. They asked him, why should we keep going back to the moon? He paused and replied, survival. Survival of our species. Warden also rejected the notion that humans could colonize planets within our solar system, calling them unsustainable. Then he claims he knows where to find habitable planets. When pressed on aliens, if he believes them or not, he said, yes. You know, I've been asked that question hundreds of times, yeah. We are the aliens though. We just think there's somebody else. But we were the ones who came from somewhere else because somebody else had to survive. They got in their little spaceship and they came here and they landed and they started civilization here. And if you don't believe me, go get books on the ancient Sumerians and see what they have to say about it. They'll tell you right up front, end quote. <laughs> okay, when you hear an astronaut say that, kind of jarring, kind of jarring. Number four, Roswell. As always, if you dig what we do here on Top 5 Scary, make sure you hit that like button. Birth of the UAP phenomenon, 1945, the US's first nuclear explosion. 1946, 1946, first underwater nuclear explosion. 1947, the first crash flying saucer. Coincidence? I think not. Especially since they've been known to hover around nuclear bases. Probably for the better. Humans are kind of the worst. Local rancher Mac Brazel finds the wreckage on his property in Lincoln County, New Mexico. Sheriff Wilcock shows RAAF's commanding officer Colonel Blanchard the materials, and during the night, the Air Force combs the entirety of the property, apparently harboring two small injured alien bodies. Taking them, of course, to Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico that night, and the very next morning, the Roswell Air Force makes a statement claiming they have recovered a crashed flying disc in local newspapers. Boom! History, baby! Photographs of Jesse Marcel, the head intelligence officer who investigated and recovered some of the debris. The very next day, the Army retracts their statement and all of a sudden, a high altitude weather balloon. Can you believe that, huh? <laughs> AKA the birth of a conspiracy theory. Nuclear fission explosions, weather balloons. Something's not adding up here. Number three, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Dean Mitchell was a US Navy officer, aviator, test pilot, engineer, NASA astronaut, and of course, a ufologist. Ufology is the pseudo term for somebody who studies the UFO phenomenon. I don't think there's a degree you can get that in. If so, I'm signing up. What school? What school, sorry? He was the lunar module pilot of the Apollo 14 in 1971 and spent nine hours working on the lunar surface. He was the sixth person to walk on the moon. Yeah, he was walking while Warden was up there drifting in the currents of space. Mitchell publicly expressed his opinions and that he was sure that there were thousands of UFOs recorded since the early 1940s belonging to other planets. Thousands. Dateline NBC conducted an interview with Mitchell in 1996. He talked about meeting with officials from three different countries who claimed that they had met extraterrestrials in person. Quote, the evidence for alien contact was very strong and classified by governments who were covering up visitations and existence of alien bodies in places such as Roswell, New Mexico. Mitchell's book, The Way of the Explorer, discusses his journey. In 2004, he told the St. Petersburg Times that the US government was studying alien bodies and that this group had specifically stopped briefing US presidents since the 1960s. He said, quote, we all know that UFOs are real. Now, the question is, where do they come from? In 2008, Mitchell then was interviewed and claimed that Roswell crash was in fact the aliens that had contacted humans several times, but that the government had hidden the truth for more than 60 years. Scary stuff, scary stuff. He sadly passed in 2016. If we just reread the credentials alone, just one more time. Number two, James McDivitt. James Alton McDivitt is an American test pilot, Air Force pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut who flew in both the Gemini and Apollo programs. 
After graduating first in his class with a Bachelor of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering, he qualified as a test pilot at the Air Force. In 1962, McDivitt was selected by NASA for the Gemini 4 mission. In 1965, he saw, filmed, and photographed an object which approached the Gemini 4 as they were orbiting Earth. Over Hawaii, a craft of some sort. The UFO had a long arm sticking out of it. Here's what Major James McDivitt said. I was flying with Ed White. He was sleeping at the time, so I don't have anybody to verify this story, but we were drifting in space when suddenly an object appeared in the window. It's a cylindrical object, white. It had a long arm that stuck out of the side. The film was sent back to NASA and reviewed by some NASA film technicians. One of them selected what he thought was what they were talking about, at least before I had the chance to review it. And it was not the picture. It was a picture of a sun reflection on the window. So what were the pictures that he was talking about? In 1975, McDivitt said, I never made a big deal out of it. It was something I definitely couldn't identify. It looked like a beer can with a pencil sticking out of it. Yeah, I would eventually give up on that too if those were my credentials and people were like, yeah, right, James. When somebody has like 25 years of designing and flying space shuttles around, when they say, hey guys, I'm seeing something up here. It's not like, oh, James, huh, clean those old specs, would you? Yuck, yuck. Houston, we have a problem. And number one, Gordon Cooper. Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr., an American aerospace engineer, test pilot, U.S. Air Force pilot, and the youngest of the seven original astronauts in Project Mercury, the first human space program in the United States. You know the pictures. It looks like they're wearing a tinfoil suit, you know? Old school, old school. After service as a fighter pilot in World War II, he qualified as a test pilot in 1956 and then was selected as an astronaut in 1959. In 1963, Cooper piloted the longest and last Mercury space flight, Mercury Atlas 9, 34 hours in space. The first American to spend an entire day in space, the first person to sleep in space, and the last American launched on a solo orbit mission. In Cooper's autobiography, Leap of Faith, co-authored by Bruce Henderson, he recounted his experiences with the Air Force and NASA and an alleged UFO conspiracy. Cooper claimed to have seen his first UFO while flying over Germany, then saw them land in a dry lake bed. Cooper claimed up until his death that the US was indeed covering up UFOs. He said that there were hundreds of reports made by his fellow pilots, many coming from the military pilots on radar. In his memoirs, Cooper wrote that he had seen unexplained aircrafts tons in his career, and that in 1978, he actually testified before the United Nations on the topic. He sadly passed in 2004. He was such a strong advocate for disclosure, and all of these astronauts are remembered as putting their neck and name out on the line for some truth. But I mean, those UFO enthusiasts, huh? <laughs> They're all wackos, right? Right? Number five, Leland Melvin. American engineer and now retired NASA astronaut Leland Melvin has spent hundreds of hours in space, literally hundreds. Leland holds four honorary doctorates for his service in education, the sciences, and philanthropy. Doctorates. I'm just saying that before the comments start rolling in saying he's just another wacko. He's crazy. They're, they're not wackos, people. Any of them. They've been screened so many times by so many people with so many tests, they have to be damn well near perfect before going up on or in NASA's budget. Before his career with NASA, Leland was actually all American for football. Detroit Lions, Toronto Argos. Guy made the NFL and then said, you know what, I think I'm gonna be an astronaut. Like, give this guy a Netflix movie, would ya? He was selected by NASA in 1998 after getting injured with a football career. Guy goes from the turf to working at NASA Langley Center. This guy's put in time, both down here and up there. Mission after mission with NASA. He's got quite the practice at the whole floating around thing. When Leland was pressed about otherworldly visitors and his ideas about the cosmos, he said this when he was working up in orbit. He had seen something translucent, curved and organic looking when he was working with fellow astronaut Randy Bresnik. The pair of them, again, pair of them, called down to NASA to ask what it could be. NASA's official response was, probably ice. Yeah, nice and specific there, Houston. Thank you for that. When has NASA ever said probably? Melvin dismissed this and figured it was NASA's explanation to just cover it up. Like, who's more qualified here? That's all I'm asking. When the most qualified people are like, yeah, I can't tell if that's frozen water or a full-on mothership, Houston. Either they shouldn't be up there at all, or we need some more Windex on those windows there, NASA. Huh? Number four, Ivan Wagner. As always, if you dig what we do here at Top 5 Scary, make sure you hit that like button or comment down below. It really helps the channel out. Have you ever seen a UFO out there? Yeah, you. 
You, have you seen one? Comment down below with some details about your experiences. I know I have twice now. Hence the obsession with all this stuff. Those Reddit rabbit holes, boy oh boy. Speaking of falling into a wormhole of conspiracy and who said what, astronaut Ivan Wagner, or I should say cosmonaut Ivan Wagner, since he's Russian by birth and although he's bunking up with some roomies up there in the ISS, he was on the ISS as a first timer just back in 2020. Does NASA initiate rookies up there? Like pull pranks on the newbies? Like no gravity just to buckle you while you sleep? Flow you out, you know? He and fellow Russian Anatoly Ivanishin were working up there alongside Chris Cassidy, the American commander of said expedition. When Wagner was orbiting the Earth, he might have captured some footage of UFOs, better known as UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. The, the jargon nowadays. The aurora lights behind Earth's beautiful curves was being recorded from the ISS when he saw a string of really weird lights moving in a really weird way. He labeled the video Space Guests. Wagner tweeted the vid, which apparently shows the aurora, Australis, near Antarctica, and then all of a sudden this blob of organized lights just cruises on over the globe. Looks like a blob of like glitter just trucking across space. Like what is that? Of course NASA didn't follow up. Like what are they gonna say? Oh yeah, those are uh, stars that move and blink, I think. I mean, no, space junk. Yeah, space debris and swamps and things. Also, what a lame excuse, space junk? Okay, so you're saying there's lots of litter up there, that's what you're saying? That's what just zipped over my house silently, defying gravity and lasered up my cow? Yeah, I don't think so, NASA. Number three, Chris Hadfield. Retired Canadian astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot, and musician. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Hadfield flew two missions and also served as commander on the International Space Station. Before his career as an astronaut, he served in the Canadian Armed Forces for 25 years as an air commander fighter pilot. So he has the credentials to say the least. In 1992, Hadfield was accepted into the Canadian astronaut program. He first flew in space in 1995 and since then, he says he's seen tons of stuff up there just zipping around that even a man with all those credentials says he can't explain. Quote, I've seen countless things in the sky but he has a pretty cool take on it. He doesn't keep it on the DL, he doesn't boast, and he doesn't panic. Seems like Chris has the mentality like, quote, to see something in the sky that you don't understand and then to immediately conclude it's intelligent life from another solar system is the height of foolishness and lack of logic. However, Chris seems to have a little dirt on Mars that maybe we all don't. He said, I think the fundamental question is that Mars was a lot like Earth four billion years ago when life first formed. So if it happened here, did it happen there? It would be evident somewhere in the geologic records. All we need is one fossil for proof. He thinks there could be potentially alien life in the clouds of Venus or on the distant moons of one of our gas giants. Researchers have suggested that there could be microbial life in the clouds of Venus because of the presence of ammonia, which on Earth is a key indicator of aquatic life. Aquatic life, eh? Atlanteans? Hadfield on the UAP phenomenon, quote, we have seven people living up there. We've been sending people to space since I was born. I spent half a year off planet looking everywhere. It makes no sense at all that intelligent life somewhere from not our solar system could cross interstellar space and just sneak around and only be caught on some strange video by fighter pilots. It just doesn't pass any basic sniff test or logic. It's fun, it's exciting, but if you use reason, the whole argument falls apart, end quote. Hmm, okay, Chris Hadfield, keep your secrets for now, you polite Canadian you. Wait till people start looking into Paul Hellier, another very polite Canadian with some secrets of his own. Until then, you keep distracting us up there with that guitar, Chris. I see you, Jake Sully. Number two, Michael Collins. NASA veteran and the very first driver up there, Mr. Michael Collins himself, served as command module pilot on the historic Apollo 11 mission in 1969. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon for the very first time saying those very first famous lines we all know so well, Collins was back parking that thing up there. Mr. Collins stayed up there by himself in lunar orbit waiting for the safe return of his crewmates. I can't even stay in a basement with the lights off by myself. Imagine being up there just drifting in the currents of matter, like being in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, no way, dude. The astronaut retired from NASA in 1970 and spent his free time answering questions on Twitter. Apparently, he has gotten some really interesting buzz. Mr. Collins invited the interweb to chat saying, quote, are we alone? Hashtag ask Michael Collins. And boy, oh boy, did he get some responses. Everything from wackos who like aliens to very, very high ranked generals and pilots who are apparently also wackos who like aliens for talking about this. Collins, quote, I used to think that NASA sent me to the wrong place, to the moon. 
because I think Mars is much, much more interesting place, end quote. Collins has talked about it in the past about the possibility of alien life existing beyond Earth and doesn't shy away from discussing the topic in full. In 1999, for instance, he even argued on the topic of life developing in other parts of this infinite cosmos. So maybe it has then. He wrote in his book saying, quote, I am alone now truly alone and absolutely isolated from any known life. Although I may feel like I'm the same person, I also feel that I am different from other people. I have been places and done things you simply would not believe. Collins circled the moon once every two hours. What's scarier, walking on an unknown rock that apparently no one's ever visited or flying all the way around it by yourself in the pitch black with no communications? Collins achieved the rank of Major General. He left NASA in 1970 to join the State Department and later became director of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington. One of the most key players in this whole thing. Michael Collins sadly passed in 2021. Number one, Buzz Aldrin. Of course, the poster child for the whole phenomenon itself, Mr. Edwin Eugene Aldrin Jr. American astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot with a doctorate of science in astronautics. This guy is overqualified, okay? Three spacewalks in 1966, Gemini 12 mission in 1969, Apollo 11 mission. He and mission commander Neil Armstrong were the first two people to land on the moon. Quote, there was something out there, close enough to be observed. What could it be? According to Aldrin on Apollo 11 to the moon, quote, I observed a light out the window that appeared to be moving alongside us. What could that have been other than a spacecraft from another country or another world? It was either the rocket that had separated from us or the four panels that moved away when we extracted the lander, right? After he returned from his missions, he was convinced he saw aliens while he was out there. Credentials aside, he took a lie detector test, people, which he passed with flying colors. In an interview with C-SPAN Buzz, he talked about the future potential of Earth's moon for humanity. He added a little extra info that might have gained the spark to go back regarding a certain monolith on a moon. Quote, visit the moon Phobos of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato object that goes around Mars once in every seven hours. When people find out about that, they're gonna say, who put that there? And you bet, Buzz, I'll be the first one to ask that. Number five on this list is the Navy UFOs. This is one of the most famous alien or UFO encounters the humans have had in the last few decades. Reader's Digest says, when it comes to extraterrestrial life and making contact with those from outer space, everyone has an opinion. Some think it's all a hack, some are open to speculate, and others still are entirely taken with the tales and stories as old as time, cameras poised in tinfoil hats at the ready. UFOs have fascinated and confused us for years as each new flying saucer or hovercraft sighting makes national news and splits us into two camps. While it's easy to debunk individual stories, it's way harder to argue with the US Department of Defense. In videos leaked back in 2007 and 2017, the Pentagon has aimed to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage that has been circulating was real. In the video, unidentified objects are seen spinning and hovering in the air and above the water while two Navy pilots remark in shock and confusion over the two oblong disc-shaped objects. So you may be thinking, well, how did the government government try to hide it if they were the ones that actually released it. Well, they did release it themselves, but we have to remember that that was only after the videos had been leaked. In 2007 and 2017, these videos had made their way to the public without the government's stamp of approval. So everyone was freaking out and speculating on what the heck this thing could be and why we hadn't heard anything about it. What the heck it is, I don't know, but why we hadn't heard about it is because because the government had chosen not to tell us. The only reason that they inevitably released the videos is because they got their hand caught in the cookie jar. They were found out. They were exposed when these videos were leaked. At that point, they could either continue to vehemently deny something that was clearly pointing towards naval activity, or they could fess up and release it themselves in hopes of taking less public backlash. They opted to do the second one because in their words, they wanted to clear up any misconceptions by the public. That, however, is code for, we got caught and we think that releasing it now would be better for us in the long run. If it was up to them though, these never would have seen the light of day. Which then makes you wonder, how many other videos like this are out there that you and me 
we just don't know about. Number four on this list is the O'Hare incident. Chicago's O'Hare International Airport had quite the interesting experience back in 2006. Reader's Digest says, on November 7th, 2006, United Flight 446 was about to depart from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport when a dozen United Airline employees spotted an odd metallic craft hovering over the gate. The employees reported that it hung in the air for several minutes before finally shooting up at breakneck speed into the clouds. The strangest part? The UFO did not register on the airport's radar despite all the witnesses. The FAA declined to investigate, chalking it up to a weather phenomenon. A weather phenomenon. Seriously? Yeah. All right there, guys. Also, for those who don't know, the FAA stands for the Federal Aviation Administration, and they're a government-run agency that deals with pretty much anything that flies. So don't get it twisted, guys. This was definitely the government deciding that they didn't want to do anything with this incident, or at the very least, they didn't want the public to know about it. But you'd think that they could come up with a better excuse than a weather incident, right? Like, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I've ever seen a weather incident cause odd metallic things to hover in the sky. Number three on this list is the seven strange crafts. So this one is really interesting because the government did address it, but they definitely didn't chalk it up to being what a lot of people thought it was in Aliens. Reader's Digest says, a 1952 incident where seven unidentified objects appeared over secure airspace near the Pentagon was captured on film. The crafts were registered on radar and jets were immediately sent to investigate these suspicious strange crafts. However, when the American jets approached that airspace, those seven objects disappeared from the radar. When the jets landed, the objects returned to the radar screen once more. President Harry S. Truman was notified, and Air Force Intelligence Director General Sanford held a press conference saying that there were reports made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It's this group of observations that we're attempting to resolve, but there was no resolution. So we kind of just heard from the government that they were on it, but then didn't really hear anything after that. There was no resolution, or at least there wasn't one that was released to the public. Could I believe that they did actually discover something here and they just decided that telling the public wouldn't be the best course of action? Absolutely I could. In fact, I almost guarantee it. I highly doubt that the American government would have seen this stuff and then after one pass with the jets just been like, well, all right, guess nothing's there and then call it quits. No, they definitely would have kept investigating and looking until they discovered something. Telling the public about that though, probably wasn't in the cards. Number two on this list is the Richard French incident. So this is definitely one of the bigger cover-ups in UFO government history. Reader's Digest says, in the 1950s, it was Lieutenant Colonel Richard French's job to explain away UFO phenomena for the government. There was only one problem. Lieutenant Colonel French actually saw alien ships with his own eyes, reports the Daily Mail. At a citizen hearing on disclosure in 2013, the then 83-year-old man told the truth for the first time about what he saw as a young man in the waters of St. John's, Newfoundland, two UFOs that had crashed and sunk in the water and aliens trying to fix them. They succeeded and took off. He didn't mention UFOs in his report at the time. How's that for a freaky government cover-up? Yeah, so that's about as government cover-up as we can get, guys. My guy legit says UFOs saw aliens and specifically omitted it to save face and not panic the public. I guess the guilt and also just the whole story had been eating away at him for decades though and eventually he had to come clean and tell the public. Too little too late though with a story like this because we never got an opportunity to investigate these aliens or talk to them or anything. Or at least that's if he's telling the truth. For all we know, he's still leaving some parts of the story out. Only the government and Richard really know what happened. And number one on this list is the unexpected visitor. A man named Rick Horsels, who lived in Texas, got a very unexpected and unwanted visitor late one evening at his home. The story goes like this. In 2008, an unfathomably large aircraft hovered above Stevensville, Texas. Many people in the community saw it, and according to the Mutual 
UFO network, a pilot named Stephen Allen reported that the unusual aircraft was flying at an estimated 3,000 miles per hour and was being chased by fighter jets. Then a man named Rick Sorrell said he saw the same thing while hunting. Later, Sorrell says a strange man knocked on his door and said, son, we have the same caliber weapons you have, but we have more of them. You need to shut your mouth about what you saw. Can you imagine getting a knock on your door and it being the government basically telling you that if you say anything, you're gonna die. Yeah, that is definitely an unexpected and unwanted visitor if you ask me. So not only were they threatening citizens, I also didn't hear any reports from the government about that jet that was flying behind the UFO. You'd think that if a jet fighter were deployed to chase down an enemy aircraft in friendly airspace, the public should probably know about it to stay safe. But nope. Absolutely nothing. Total radio silence from the government. How many other times have they gone to someone's house and threatened them like this that we don't know about? How many people have been intimidated by the government to stay silent? Really scary question that, honestly, we might not even want to know the answer to.